Good evening, and thank you so much for tuning in and joining us this evening for our online fundraiser, Safe at Home. We're here speaking with you tonight at 180's home, our emergency safe house. I'm Anna Diaz-White, and I'm 180's executive director, and I'm here with Brian Nelson, 180's board president. Together, we are hoping this evening brings you a bit closer to our mission as we are going to take a unique look at our life-changing and life-saving services. Hopefully, we'll be able to gather together soon in person, as we usually do for our annual celebration. But tonight's online gathering gives us a chance to share with you our mission and the challenges of the past year providing services throughout the pandemic. We're honored to introduce you to several of our outstanding counselors who truly are our frontline heroes throughout the pandemic, providing essential services which enabled our safe house, hotlines, and counseling services to remain open never missing a day or a moment throughout the very challenging moments that we've experienced. As you view our program tonight, we encourage you to join in with a personal donation of your own. Anna, can you tell us a bit about how the pandemic impacted domestic violence and 180's response? Well, as you know, Brian, it's been a terrible, terrible year, not just for us, but for our community. And um, as we uh, began to face the, the, uh, the closures, et cetera, we found that um, calls, hotline calls were down and it scared us to be quite honest with you because we knew domestic violence and sexual assault didn't just stop because there was a, a pandemic. Um, but the hotlines were eerily quiet initially for the first few weeks. Police departments weren't allowing uh, people into the department so our volunteers weren't able to meet victims in, in the police departments as we normally do. and. Um, even the uh, hospital emergency rooms where our volunteers meet victims of sexual assault and rape uh, in hospital emergency rooms. Well, of course, in the early months, they were not allowing uh, our volunteers into, uh, into the hospital. So things were really strange and we had to really quickly pivot uh, in terms of how to provide services and make sure that clients knew that we were here for them. And so we you know, deployed cell phones to all the volunteers um, so that they could either pass the cell phone to, to personnel that uh, was working with, with the survivors. And so our initial communication with clients started um, being mostly on the phones. Um, and of course, that's great if uh, the clients were safe, um, but if the abuser was in the home with them, then that became a problem. How did they cope during that period? How were they able to reach out to and contact 180? We had people calling from bathrooms. We had people calling from their cars, people calling from, you know, they took walks and, and brought their phones with them. There were ch changes and challenges for all of us, but for victims of domestic violence in particular, those changes made things much scarier in their home and, uh, and potentially deadly. The pandemic has served to exacerbate domestic violence, yet the stories of past survivors are still relevant today. Their journey, courage, and strength illustrates how victims transform into survivors and even thrivers with the support of 180 services. Let's hear from some of these past clients. It's very insidious. When you're in a bad relationship, you really don't even see it happening. It's absolute shame of this is where my life is, and this is what I've done to myself, and I don't want anybody to know. All of a sudden, there was a backpack with my clothes in it and a toothbrush, and we're running down the driveway for our life to get in the car before he can get to us. My son was in first grade, and he told his teacher that he was afraid to sleep in his bedroom because when dad comes in to kill everybody, he wanted to kill him first, so this way he didn't have to see everybody else die. I was probably maybe like four or five years old. I remember opening the windows, screaming for help out the windows. I remember picking up the phone to try to call 911, and as I'm dialing, the phone cord's getting ripped out of the wall. My mom is standing in the middle of the living room, and I look at her, and I look over at him, and he pointed the gun at her. All I thought of was, don't kill my mom. So I ran and wrapped my arms around her and held her as tight as I could, because if he was gonna kill her, I didn't want to be without her. I said, please just, can you, you know, move out, like we just need a break. And he said, I'm not leaving. And if you try to leave, I will kill you. I will bury you in the mountains. Nobody will ever find you. 
and they'll just think you were a new mom who just couldn't handle it. And he pulled out a gun and put it to my head, and I said, do it. I can't live like this. And he shot past me, right into the cabinet. Do you think that that would have been enough for me to leave him? No. What did I do? I get out wood putty. Did a really good job on hiding evidence. He had me backed up against a wall and literally punched a hole in the wall right next to my face. My mom told me that she was amazed, one, because he swung, but more because she said my hair blew, but I never flinched. And that was my moment when I was done. And I think at that moment is when my mom was done. There was a period of time where our daughter actually would go you know, back and forth, and I kept saying, you know, this isn't safe, and this isn't safe. Once my daughter was hurt, the courts did have to step in, and my ex-husband actually went to jail. 180 is so unique. I could go to one place in the court and get access to everything. And having a place, a forum with all women who aren't shocked and aren't judging you and telling you, well, why don't you just leave? You can't just leave. What 180 does is it gives you a place where you don't have to be ashamed, and you don't have to feel guilty, but you can feel support. They just want to help you get out of that situation. I probably would have went back if it wasn't for 180 because I, I didn't have anything. And 180 gave me a new start in life. My mother was a victim of domestic violence. I was a victim of domestic violence, but we're survivors. My mom's alive. My brother's doing well. You know, if it really wasn't for 180, I, I don't know if my mom would still be here today. We are also honored to share with you stories from some of the women whose lives your donations have changed, and we thank each of them for having the courage to share their journey with us. They do so in hopes of raising awareness for others who might be viewing this video tonight and who may need our help. And they also share with us their stories in hopes that their journey inspires our community to financially support 180. Without donations from people like you, we simply could not save and change lives. Like most abusive relationships didn't start right away. It started little by little um, during the duration of our relationship, which was about like oh, pretty close to four years. It started with the emotional and verbal abuse. One time it had gotten uh, physical. I thought that, you know, I would be able to figure it out and get out of it on my own. They often don't come to us right away. They first try to fix the situation however they can. Often the abuser tells them that it's their fault. You have to try to break through the barriers a little bit to try and find out what's really going on. And sometimes they don't want to tell us anything and it makes it very difficult. One thing we know that over time, the abuse and the violence and intimate partner violence tends to increase in frequency and severity. And what we want to do is catch it early. We want to see people before the bruises, broken bones, death threats, use of weapons. In 2019, in the township of Hazlitt, we had approximately 89 calls for service, domestic violence related. Fast forward a year to 2020, and those calls for service jumped up to 130, which roughly a 40% increase. It's you know a change by 41 calls, which is a huge number. 40% is very big, and that's 100% due to the fact that people are quarantined together, and they're with each other, they're stuck in the houses together. It was actually sexual abuse that, that time after our daughter was born. Um, he had gone out drinking, and he had come home that night after the kids were sleeping, and that's why um, I was just so, so um, in shock I wanted to call the police, but I was just afraid. I didn't want the police to be there to scare the kids. I really like thought about taking my life at that point. It was very, very, it was a very dark place for me mentally. And I thought about my kids and I felt like a failure. I started seeing a mental health specialist. I told them what was going on and they again urged me like, you know, that's domestic violence. You shouldn't have to deal with that. And the abuse continued and I just um, 
One day I just was like, this is it. I, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm going to seriously hurt myself. I ended up going to social services and um, you know, they helped me call 180. When they finally told me that there was space at the safe house, I packed everything that me and the kids had in the trunk of my, uh, my old Subaru. And uh, once we were here, it was great to just be able to have a breather to know like, okay, we're gonna be here for a little bit. We'll be able to get help with, you know, services. I'll have someone to talk to a case manager and um, we can kind of catch our breath from everything going on. Just imagine these children coming out from their houses, leaving everything behind. As soon as they come over here, we try to ease that transition by providing with not just the love and the care and everything, but you know, toys and celebration of birthday and you know, any festivity. So to just help them to adjust uh, to this awful transition, to these changes that are taking place in their life that they sometimes don't even understand. The, the biggest thing about how the safe house helped me is that I was able to kind of, ha I was able to have privacy, I was able to have dignity, and I was able to have the opportunity to kind of get us out of it again, but this time with a stronger team of support than I had by myself, you know, years prior. We are only part of the process, that we are giving information, tools, and resources to survivors to help enhance what they're doing already. We have individual counseling, all of our services are free, including the individual counseling. My role and the passion that I have as the counselor is to help them make that change in their life. Because I know, I know that they have the strength to do that, but as a counselor, I have to let them know that they do have the strength to change their life and turn their lives around. We provide with everything, food, toiletries, clothing, uh, transportation, legal, they come here and they found a house, and in the house, everything. They can eat whatever they want to eat, whatever they need. We make sure that we are able to provide it here while they are here with us. It was like welcoming, it felt like a house. We had a, a private room where we were able to, you know, shower and everything, um, as opposed to, you know, having to worry about sharing a bathroom. And we were able to close our door at night. Just having that privacy and just having a place where I could be, where I can kind of think and figure things out and talk to the kids was really, really helpful. And that's what the safe house was. It was calm, it was quiet, uh, tranquil place. And uh, another thing too is they helped me get a new vehicle. I'm like extremely grateful. I still drive it today. Once they come over here and they know about resources available and how they can improve their life and move forward, uh, the decision of not going back is basically made, I, I guess, almost immediately. It's like, yes, I do have the opportunity for a better life now. 180 definitely did turn my life around. The name is befitting of it because it really did. It gave me a second chance. It turned everything around from like a really, you know, down place to like a, an upswing. As you just heard from our client survivors and Anna earlier, 180's work has never been more in demand than it is now. It is in these uncertain and troubling times that our community looks to us even more. So with that, your donations are needed to help us meet the rising need. Your support provides a lifeline to our families. Please pledge your continued support to those we serve by clicking the link you see on your screen, or you can text 180SAFE to 41444. We'd like to conclude our presentation in tonight's virtual event by acknowledging our frontline heroes who provide 24 seven services. They are our warriors. Their work is essential. Our counselors and advocates the Safe House staff who left their own families throughout the pandemic to keep the Safe House household operating and giving the families the love and care they deserve. Their work inspires all of us. One of the, the best things that I can think of from 180 actually affecting my life, my family's life, is that, you know, they were there for us. They gave us a place to live and they gave us the hope to keep living and being who we are. It's amazing how happy you could be when you're not living in fear. It's important, it's an, it's an absolutely necessary thing and so it doesn't exist anymore, we will always need resources for women and children and just anyone going through domestic violence. There needs to be a place where you can be safe and you can get away from the abuser and just 
get a second life, a, a second shot at life. We're here for these women, and 180 is here to help them find their voice. I feel like there's been multiple services that I've been able to utilize. It hasn't just been one. And I'm sure that there are people who maybe just need one, and there are people who probably need a lot more. And so um, it's awesome that we have this one place that you can get anything you need. Thank you to our donors and the people that are always, you know, taking care of our safe house by donating time, donating resources. All of our programs, our hotline, our safe house, our counseling program, our program for children, Amanda's easel, our programs in the courts, none of it would be possible without the generous support of Monmouth County residents and community leaders. We are in debt to those who have taken it upon themselves to realize this is an important service that needs to be continued. And we are so grateful for their help and support. It's not that you're just giving money, you're giving somebody an opportunity to have a second life and a chance, and that you can't put money on. 180 is small, but our work is powerful. Our most challenging and pressing concern is to continue meeting the unique needs of every survivor who finds the strength and courage to reach out to us for help. Your continued belief in our mission and financial support will allow us to rise to this challenge and service additional survivors by providing the critical services they need in a safe, free, and confidential setting. Your financial support will enable us to empower survivors as they rebuild their shattered lives. With your generosity, our families become resilient and can find hope amidst fear and heartbreak as they emerge stronger, more independent, and more confident as they meet life's next challenge. On behalf of our survivor families, volunteers, staff, and fellow board members, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the sponsors of tonight's event, especially our lead and presenting sponsor, Carol Stillwell of Stillwell Hanson. We would also like to thank the following generous supporters, New Jersey Natural Gas, a New Jersey resources company, Jersey Central Power and Lights First Energy Foundation, Witham Wealth Management, the Grunin Foundation, Kivit Public Relations, Legacy Pharmacy Group, Archer Attorneys at Law, Bob and Mary Eileen Farratt, and the Princeton Public Affairs Group.